Okay, welcome back to the Daily Fantasy Flex podcast. This is Brian. We're recording this on a Monday night. It is uh, end of July. Uh, normally, this is, you know, we're just finishing uh, the Open Championship over in Europe, uh, and we have a couple uh, other tournaments for PGA uh, before we get to the PGA Championship, but not this year because of the Olympics. So we got the PGA Championship moved up to the end of July, and that means we're talking about it now. So two, ma- two majors in three weeks. Uh, that means I'm here with Colin and Pete. Guys, what's going on? Happy major week, you guys. Again, I can't believe it's so this far up, and I can't believe we're on our last one of the year, the last chance to become a millionaire off of golf this year. Time flies when you're having fun. Certainly does, and uh, it's exciting. I, I wish there was a little more space, but at the same time, it's like it kind of feels like the NFL right now. It feels like golf is the NFL, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Obviously, it's great to have all the best players in the world, and uh, fourth major, it's going to be great coverage, and um, yeah. Pricing is soft as always, so lots of interesting choices to look at for uh, making lineups. Yep, pricing is indeed soft, and we'll get into that for sure. That's always a fun dynamic for majors. Uh, I definitely want to spend as much time talking about this uh, this tournament, the PGA Championship. Um, but real quickly, I just want to give you guys the opportunity. Uh, we usually start with uh, if you learned anything from last week, or even if you just sort of thinking back to the major two weeks ago, the Open Championship. Is there any any sort of thoughts that you're bringing in from last week into this week? Maybe just some some recent play from some of the top guys, or you want to head head in straight into the PGA? Um, I think the only like it's kind of another point in uh, has DJ done enough to be the number one golfer in the world right now. Uh, it's luckily that him and Jason Day are playing at the same spot because Day has had that forever. Uh, I think he's done enough in my mind to be number one at this point. It's kind of like it, it's maybe nothing like really to take away from for my long term process, but it's just kind of like, all right, at what point do you give him kind of? He said he made the leap. Uh, Pete, you might have been on him and say he made the leap like maybe a couple of weeks ago. I was kind of more fifty fifty on it, but like he's especially from a DFS perspective. Uh, I think he's the number one overall player right now. Do you agree, and or did you get to that conclusion earlier? I agree. I mean, I've been, I've, I've definitely been on Dustin Johnson throughout the year. Uh, it was a lot easier to just kind of roster him all the time when he was cheaper than Day McIlroy and even Spieth. Um, now that he's priced at the top, I think it's reasonable. I think he's priced fairly. I guess it's a hundred cheaper than Day at this point, um, but. You know, he was more expensive than the Canadian Open. I ended up taking Day because of a tee time. This week, I prefer DJ, I think, at this point in time. But, um, yeah, he's definitely the number one golfer in my mind uh, based on this, this season. Um, but all these guys are close. Like Rory, um, I think there's a lot of reasons to like Rory this week, too. So Rory, Dustin, and Jason Day are all elite plays. Speed has definitely fallen off, and uh, we can talk a little bit more about that, I guess, later on. But, yeah, I'm with you. And uh, one other thing I picked up. Uh, Vegas did win at uh, $6,500 coming into this week. So there's something, um, I don't know how much he'll be owned. If there'll be any recency bias to that, but it's something to pay attention to. It might be worth a sprinkle in a GPP. Um, not a huge fan of his in general, but uh, definitely a golfer who's been known to get hot. So that's something uh, that's at least intriguing, I guess. Yeah. He ran well last week in the models. Yeah, shout out for sure. Yeah, our models, um, and you can obviously build your own. We had a user who built his own model uh, and entered um, some of the some of the tournaments last week and ended up winning fifteen thousand dollars off. Uh, I think it was one of the three dollar tournaments. He took second place uh, and had Vegas uh, high in his model. So he had tweeted us and said that. Uh, he built his model, had Vegas high, ended up taking 15 grand. So uh, congrats to him for sure. Always love hearing those stories. And hopefully we can hear some more for, for this week. Um, awesome. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get into this week's tournament uh, taking place in New Jersey. Uh, Colin, I'll kick to you. Uh, but first, just a couple show notes. Since this is a major week, we're definitely going to uh, keep the same sort of schedule. We're having this pod. Uh, Pete is going to do some videos for us. He's going to put out a video uh, of his personal model and how he built his model for this week's PGA Championship. He's also going to do some periscoping at some points. And then, uh, of course, we will have our live show as we normally do for majors. That's going to be 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern time on Wednesday. So please uh, uh, 
and join us uh, at, at that time. We'll answer questions. We'll go over weather. It uh, looks like we might have a little rain this weekend, but may probably shouldn't be as big of a deal as it was uh, a couple of weeks ago in the Open Championship. But we'll definitely go over all that line movement, uh, all the sort of important things on Wednesday night. So uh, definitely tune in with us Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Okay, enough for that. Let's get into this tournament. Colin, course breakdown. Hit me with it. So Baltus Roll last got played in 2005. And again, that kind of violates my rule of don't take anything past five years. Uh, but I think uh, I have, from what I've read, there's not a whole lot of reason to believe that it's different than 2005. And the last time it got played, it was definitely a bombers course, like far and away highest uh, of any other stat. Uh, I think I'm probably going to give Bombers a boost as well this year because I haven't seen anything that suggests that uh, it's going to be any different than last time. So I'm hoping you guys can uh, either confirm or deny uh, what kind of my data-driven take on it. Absolutely. It looks like a Bombers course. Uh, it's only a par 70, um, but it's still a very, very long course. There's long par 3s and there's long par 4s. So definitely driving distance is critical. and um, yeah, I think a lot of the bombers that we like to play are going to be popular plays. And certainly uh, at the top, uh, you know, Day, Johnson, McElroy, all those guys have plenty of distance, some of the best long ball hitters in the game. And uh, with the pricing, you can definitely fit two of those guys in lineups if you want to go that way. So, uh, um, course is, uh, it's, you know, there's not a ton of course history like the Masters with Augusta, but certainly an angle we can take here. And I'm definitely waiting uh, driving distance in my model. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, so, how do you think that the, the fact that, and this is going back to how it was at the, a couple of weeks ago at the Open Championship, but it's a little more extreme. Uh, the Open Championship jumps around with courses, but uh, last year it was played at the same course um, at, at Royal Troon, so we at least have that data to go off of. Whereas this year, you're right, Colin, it's, it doesn't fit your five-year window, and there's really no data to go off of, and I know um, there's some people talking about the certain types of grasses. We'll get into all of that. that that's fine. Um, but what does it do as far as, you know, how you approach players, Colin? And, and Pete, you can answer this as well. Are you going to try to find narratives where people try to fit to the course uh, a little more than they should have since, you know, if, if we don't know if it's that predictive, maybe we can sort of fade those narratives? So is the question then kind of like if you have little, like, uh, if you don't have enough course history, can you kind of boost it with other supplementary stuff? Sure. Uh, I guess like the, I mean, I prefer, I take a more conservative approach saying like if I don't have as much information, then uh, ultimately maybe that means you don't have as much edge if you believe that information translates to edge and ultimately maybe you don't bet as much because you're not as sure of your ability to navigate as much as other people. I think you get way more in trouble when you have these holes in your process saying like, oh, I usually have all of this data, but I'm missing it this time. Can I fill it with something else? Like that's just a round peg in a square hole type of thing. Like if you don't have info, don't try to force feed it. Uh, you just kind of like the DFS version of take what the defense gives you. And like sometimes the, the, when the defense doesn't give you a lot, it's the, the setup doesn't give you a lot. I have a sparse course history and there's no way around that. Uh, don't try to pretend otherwise. So yeah, that's, I mean, I, I, I don't know, Matt, Pete, is there any else, anything else that you can kind of supplement or replace with? Or? No, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, you can look at a couple things. Uh, one thing when we, we don't have quite as much history, uh, I really like taking a look at the course. And one thing that is interesting about this course, uh, Colin, not applicable to you because we know you're not going to watch one second of this tournament. But right. hole 17 and hole 18 are both par fives, the only par fives on the course, I believe. Um, so there's a lot of drama at the end. But uh, just looking through the course, I mean, that's why I it just makes sense as a bomber's course. Um, you know, you're looking at par fours that are up to 500 yards. You're looking at, a, you know, multiple 200-yard par threes. So – Long irons, long drives are going to be critical at this place. And, um, yeah, so that, that, that's kind of just – that confirms, um, you know, the one angle that I, I want to take uh, on the week. And uh, I definitely agree with you. It's dangerous to start trying to figure out um, other data to put in place of – or not even data, but other, you know, stuff in place of your process in the past. I think you shouldn't be searching for that. But 
you know, one thing I will do this week and one thing that's nice um, that actually applies, it's very obvious uh, that it's a, a bomber's course to me. Awesome. Uh, another question that I, that I want to ask you guys is about recency bias. And I think that's something that might be uh, a little more prevalent this week, you know, in most of these, uh, most of these PGA seasons will have a major and then we'll have several weeks uh, of non-major tournaments. So we'll have a guy like Danny Willett that performs really well, but then we have a, a long layover until the next major. Uh, so recency bias can sort of die off a little bit. Uh, but this, this year, because of the Olympics, you know, we have these two majors just back to back, really. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, guys like Henrik Stenson and Phil Mickelson who performed so well just a week ago. Uh, so I'm curious if, if recency bias and, and guys just taking those guys because they just watch them perform at such a high level so recently, if that's going to be a major factor in ownership and perhaps uh, game theory and, and roster construction for you, Pete. Absolutely. I mean, people are definitely going to be on the guys who did well at the Open. It's fresh in their mind. The other part that plays a, a big factor is it's you know, their current form. That's like, <laughs> that is the tournament that's the most current form for most of these guys. Um, obviously, it's a major, so you're going to weight that maybe even slightly, I wouldn't say heavier, but maybe a little bit more. Um, and, you know, those guys, especially Stenson and Mickelson, they were on TV all day long, and people remember that historic Sunday match they had. Uh, how well they're playing. So I, I do think they'll be more heavily owned. Um, it's a tough thing to kind of figure out from a cash game perspective how to handle. Obviously, they're just going to play the optimal guys. But, you know, Henrik Stenson, for example, like all his current stats are just so off the charts. Um, so it's interesting how to kind of evaluate him. Uh, Colin talked briefly about the performance are just so, you know, such a big outlier relative to everyone else. We know that Phil and Stenson also got a huge weather break uh, with the British. So it's a real Interesting question. Uh, I do think there's going to be recency bias. Uh, there's definitely opportunity in that uh, for tournaments. Um, but Colin, curious your thoughts just on some of, exactly like Stenson, I guess. He's the one. Uh, he's number one in my model right now, but that's because if you wait any current stats, he's just blowing those off the charts. So what are your thoughts on that, Colin? My open question this week is actually, does recency, I mean, we, we kind of all try to have that little contrary, you know, assume that like the last major that people watched will influence ownership maybe disproportionately. And Brian, to your point, the fact that it's so recent that maybe that accelerates. Uh, I like that in a vacuum. The only thing that I'm wondering if it maybe doesn't apply this week, uh, I mean, and specifically around the millionaire maker, which I think most of our contrarian stuff is oriented around, is a millionaire maker isn't filling as much. Uh, so maybe there's a little bit less dead money and maybe the recent, that recency bias factor that you would otherwise say like, yeah, they're just watching them. Everybody's going to be on them. Uh, isn't going to be as much just because there's not as many people playing. Um, that gets into that's seventh level metagaming admittedly. And that probably just like smacks of overthinking it. No, but, that's exactly right. I mean, you can look through who's in the millionaire maker and who's making it up and, um, but just the nature of it, it, you know, one thing for DraftKings, um, it's a big challenge to have these two majors back to back because a big part of their process for making these big tournaments and having these huge contests for the majors is having qualifiers running satellites for these, you know, big, big tournaments. And they only had a week to do that with baseball and uh, a little bit of golf. So, or the Canadian Open. So it, it's a big challenge in that regard. And you'll see, um, you know, a lot of the guys who are playing a lot of golf um, tournament action um, be a big percentage of the games. So I think that's a sharp point. And um, yeah, maybe we are, maybe, maybe that's the right meta to be on. Um, but Specific to Stenson, I guess we can talk about him in a little bit. Uh, he's one guy that I'm really trying to figure out, like how good of a play. Because again, in my model, he's so much, he's, he's rated so high. I guess Dustin Johnson in one model I created was rated higher than him, but it's DJ and Stenson and all my stuff right now. Yeah, and I think the only other thing kind of note on that, like recency note, is that we did, say it is a major, so it's soft pricing. But it's, I don't think it's as soft as, say, like the Masters, where they have prices out three weeks in advance. Right. Uh, I don't think there are any results that the lines have not priced in because they didn't release this before. Did they release the pricing before uh, last week's tournament? The they got it up after the British. I think that the Canadian stuff's not priced in. Um, yeah, so even then, that's like one tournament. Whereas like normally we get two or three that aren't priced in. Right, and the Masters had a ton. Um, and the other thing, too, is – they're just they're just dialing the price down of every golfer. I mean, the most expensive guys eleven seven. So what you're saying is true. The relativeness of the 
you know, pricing is pretty accurate, um, but it's still diluted enough where you can have, you know, you can have, you know, Dustin Johnson and Hendrick Stenson in your lineup easily. Dustin Johnson and yeah. JJ even, so. Yeah, what is the way, it kind of begs the question, what, is, what does it mean when you say this is the, t the, the pricing is the tightest of any major? It's still a major, so it's loose pricing, so how much, and what do you do differently if the pricing is tighter? Uh, right. I don't know, yeah. It's tougher to leave money on the table to differentiate yourself. I guess that's the you still want to do it anyway. Yeah, I'm struggling to find out like practically what you do different, but right. uh, it's food for thought in any case. And we probably won't see this ever again. So I'm just trying to figure. All right, we're never going to have back-to-back -back majors this week. So you know, it's like find every angle and every conceivable like once in a lifetime like opportunity type of stuff. Right. No, and it's fun. Uh, the best part about it too is you have all the big names and a lot of the big names in golf are all really uh, intriguing plays this week. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Colin, I know you had had thoughts about um, you, you, just the fact that Stenson and Mickelson were so far above their competition two weeks ago. I mean, just crushed their competition uh, by double-digit strokes and how that could potentially skew the data. Uh, did you have any more thoughts on that? No, I haven't done uh, any actual number crunching on uh, if there's a skew to that or not. If I had to guess which way does it lie, uh, I would probably say that Mickelson and Stenson are probably going to be overrated in people's models. Like, and that's probably why Stenson is like probably so high in your model, Pete, is because he has this one super outlier of a good round. I don't think that much of that bleeds over and the next I mean, like, he has been otherworldly forever, but, like, if, if you had just have simple averages, I might even ding him at Mickelson uh, just a little bit just because there's so, that outlier is boosting them so much on everything. So, right. yeah, that's just kind of proceed with them with caution. Yep. Okay, fair enough. Um, and, and there's definitely a lot of other factors that we're going to get into, uh, but we're going to hit those on our Wednesday live show. Uh, like weather, like uh, Vegas odds and line movement, um, and, and all those things. Those are uh, just better things to discuss as we get closer to the tournament. We have better data. Uh, so we'll do that Wednesday, 9 p.m. Eastern time uh, for the live show. So, let, let, uh, you know, since we're going to do that then, let's, let's go ahead and jump right into our player tiers. And, uh, you know, we have obviously a, a large loaded field as we do on, on any major uh, so let, let's jump in as much as we can. We're going to do four tiers uh, like we normally do for our majors. Uh, most tournaments, we just do three tiers. But since it's so loaded and, and so big, we're going to do that. Uh, so let's start with the bottom tier, guys. Uh, so we're going to do um, $6,500 on, on DraftKings or lower. So we're talking the guys that are right at uh, Vegas, who just won last week. We have Ryan Moore. Uh, we have Andrew Johnson, um, Smiley, those guys in below. Uh, Colin, I'll start with you. Those like really bargain bin guys, who stands out the most uh, for you to, uh, this week? Well, it does seem like kind of back to the old bargain bin guys here. Brennan Steele, who always seems to pop up, and he's all the way down at 6,000 this time. And I'm on him generally, but I think what the last time that we saw him – uh, priced at anything. It was at the British, and he was, uh, he would, yeah, he was 6,100 there, major pricing, but like a quick and loans, he was 9,900, right? Admittedly, in a weaker field. The only bad result he had is pretty much at that British Open. Where he got the bad side of the draw. That much. So, like, is it worth that much of a drop? I don't know. But then again, Brendan Steele is almost like the poor man's JB Holmes for me in terms of I I have him high every week. I'm wondering what I'm missing. Maybe there's just some sort of bias in terms of why I never feel super jazzed about rostering him. But he's the one that pops in the bargain bin far away the most of everybody. Uh, back elsewhere here, uh, Charles Howell is actually popping, who I haven't seen forever. Uh, and for what it's worth, again, I'm not sure how much to wait course history here as much since it was 11 years ago, but he does have a result here from back in the day, and it was pretty good. Uh, other people down on the list, Charlie Hoffman, who is kind of on a skid, I think. I think he hasn't, he hasn't put up uh, the numbers he was putting up in Texas or anything, but um, still only um, has one missed cut all year. There's an argument that he's disappointed otherwise, but uh, maybe that's the case if he's just reverting into solid cash game territory, or maybe he doesn't have the upside price to win, but uh, seems still seems pretty reliable and has a good floor. 
on, and then the only other guys that are kind of right there with him are Andy Sullivan and Francesco Molinari. Uh, Molinari we talk about all the time. And uh, Andy Sullivan, I'm just, yeah, like that just seems like he's a major pricing and uh, he shouldn't be that low. So, Pete, who do you like? Who do you hate? Uh, where I get wrong there? No, I think, I think you got all the guys. Molinari, we talk about, he's going to be higher, but this is like the exact opposite type of course and situation where you want to take Molinari, in my opinion. Uh, the one knock on him, I had him last week. He was actually the golfer that was going to make or break, or I'm sorry, for the, for the open I had him. Um, and all my elite teams on Friday uh, all had Molinari. And he just didn't make any birdies on the weekend. Um, and that's one of the things that, that's kind of disappointing about him. And he's definitely much more of an accuracy guy than uh, a driving distance guy. So he's still up there because he's a better golfer than that price. But um, that's the one guy I'm probably not going to have exposure to. And he's normally a guy I like quite a bit. Uh, I think Steele is far, far and away the best value. I think Hoffman will be really popular. He hit on the two guys that I think will soak up the most ownership in this range. Um, I think Sullivan's fine. Um, I mean, who knows how much I'll have of him. just depends on roster construction. Uh, the one other guy that I will have exposure to, and uh, I've talked about him before, but uh, the Wiley veteran, uh, BJ Singh, the oldest player in the field. I'm going to have exposure to BJ. So how's he, is he rating for you at all, Colin? He's not bad. Again, I don't have his aging curve penalty kind of priced in properly, but um, I don't know. Like, aging like, like a normal human being. Yeah, like that. I mean, there's reason to believe that. All right, maybe he's you know defying the aging curve because he is so physically fit. So like, if you want that, and like, if I so if those two cancel out, like, I mean, I still prefer a couple other people above him. Even take like you know like Chris Kirk, Pat Desire, Roberto Castro, even Cameron Tringale. Tringale. Uh, I heard a, a couple. One guy in the golf channel predicted that he's going to win. BJ Singh, he was like, that was his dark horse. And I heard a couple other people talk about him. And I'm just, you know, that's 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 a little. Um, I don't even. There's not too much to back it up, but he'll be on like two or three millionaire maker teams. That's it. You nailed my guys. I mean, like, yeah, it's gonna be, like sure, I'll, I'll give you contrarian. Yeah, like, absolutely. He's, the problem is he's not even going to be contrarian or that contrarian because other people have talked him up, but. I just, I, 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 I'm buying, I'm buying BJ Singh for whatever reason. I'm buying, I'm buying two. So split between like the 17 year olds and the 57 year olds. Like, oh, no. anybody on the I'm gonna make the all old man team. I'm gonna go like Sergio. Uh, the problem is all like the it's right. harder to spend the salary and then you have to go Phil Nicholson obviously. Uh, Sergio, I don't even know Bubba Scott out of uh, Bubba Watson and Scott are definitely not old. It's tough to spend the salary with like an old man yeah. squad. I mean, yeah, like no, I mean Stenson's up there, isn't he? He's Stenson's up there. I guess I'd have to go. St- I'd, I'd go. Yeah, I'd be the all recency bias team though too. So. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that that tier is pretty self-explanatory. I think there's a couple guys. There's a lot of guys that are really intriguing in the next year. Uh, real quickly on this tier, Jamie Lovemark, if you believe driving distance is important, he he struggled in the last two tournaments, but they've really not fit him very well. I mean, like he's played in the last several tournaments on that he's played in have been very accuracy GIR courses. Uh, if you look back to, you know, a notable uh, distance course, which was Zurich, he, you know, placed second in that. So if, you, if you're believing distance, is that potential play here for you? Yeah, I, like I think like, I, I can't tell a whole. I mean, I him and Jason Kokrak are kind of in a similar boat in my mind. Where if you believe distance is a thing, they're both good sub six k options. Kokrak's um, been touted too. Yeah, I, I believe. I, don't, I, don't I believe both of those are the course fit flyer. That's a good call. Yeah, another another flyer along that regard. If you're if you really want to get into flyers, and I think these guys are even more risk reward than someone like BJ Singh, who I think is risk reward, obviously, but. These guys are really the the high upside, but carry a lot of risk. I'm definitely not a cash game. Smiley Kaufman is another guy who it's a long ways. He's part of that infamous uh, beach trip with Ricky Fowler, Jordan Spieth, and Justin Thomas. Uh, definitely has the distance. Had a wrist injury um, earlier on in the year and just hasn't been the same after. The, he had great form with 8, 12, 17, 29. And then uh, the Zurich was where he was actually wearing it. He had a taped wrist where he was a popular pick. And since then, he's missed, you know, five cuts out of uh, seven or eight tournaments. So, hasn't been the same. Um, out of the last three tournaments, though, he did have a 10th and a 27th uh, in particular, which is, you know, the one interesting thing to be Bridgestone, his average driving distance was 320 yards. So, he's another just total long, you know, 
flyer and a long ball guy, but there is some validity to his upside and talent, I think. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Well, let's, uh, let's move to this next tier, Pete. I'll, I'll let you kick this one off. So, uh, we went up to six, five in the last year. So we'll start six, six, uh, and let's go up to, uh, let's go up to seven, six. So right before we get to the JB Holmes, uh, just love fest that is going to happen on this podcast. Yeah. There's, there's, there's two guys at 7,700 who are really good. Um, I mean, this is where it's loaded. That's why I really, when I dip below, I'm probably only going to do steel and maybe a little bit of Charlie Hoffman and my core. Uh, there's so many great players in this range uh, that I think you can, you can really consider. Uh, Gary Woodland's the first one if you're going to play the course fit. Um, definitely has a driving distance, uh, although hasn't been hitting it quite as far recently, which is a little bit of a concern to me, but um, he's still a, a great fit. 6,700 is a great price on him. And then you have the two guys at 7,300 who I think are going to soak up a lot of ownership and be very popular cash game plays, Schwartzel and Rafa Cabrera-Beo. Um, Cabrera-Beo is not really a long ball hitter, but he's been playing way too good to be that price. Great green regulation stats uh, and is very accurate uh, and reasonably long. It's not like he's short off the tee. 285 uh, recent driving distance, 288 career long term. So he hits it far enough, but uh, definitely a really intriguing play in that range. I mean, there's so many guys uh, that I think um, you can make a valid argument for in this range. Uh, I love Justin Thomas, um, Ryan Palmer at 7200. I know Colin will have popping. Um, Colin, I'll, 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 I'll let you go. Uh, since I want to take everyone here. No, you're only taking you're only taking the top three so far. So, but I still got plenty left under that. Uh, oh, we're in the top three, real quick. Little Schwartz and Palmer. Yeah. Uh, which sounds about right. I mean, right under under there is Grio, who you just as easily could have named, probably like if you want to go. Not you know. quite the perfect course fit for him, but I'm still going to buy him. I'm just no, yeah, like you know, I mean, no, it's not a perfect course fit, but that just depends on all right, like how much do you really want to dig him? And it's like, no yeah. Problem. Level. Yeah, still pretty cheap. Um, the guy that's still popping here, and like I probably like I know enough to discount here is Daniel Berger. I mean, he is popping. Do you agree that that's you, know, well, you can't you can't play Berger most likely because uh, yeah. we don't know about the entry. That uh, there are some entries to be aware of. Chris Wood, um, who's in the last year, who's intriguing. Um, we obviously have Brooks Kepka, who has the ankle injury. Uh, we assume he's going to be back and doing well, but I'm still waiting for more information. So. We'll have a stronger take on him. He's really cheap. What's his price? Kepka's a, a, a steal if we assume he's, he's just high. above here. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to him in a bit. Um, and then uh, also Berger with the wrist. Berger is like the one I'm the most nervous about. Yeah, I, there's just too much injury red flag. There. The sh- sorry, not the wrist, the shoulder for Berger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Snedeker, I think, has a good result that's not priced in because uh, Canadians just last week, so like there's some non-priced in stuff. Uh, and then the obligatory, I mean, I don't like him as much as some of the other guys, but from maybe under the radar perspective, there's a Euro in here, Tyrell Hatton, who I think has posted some solid results and maybe like due to name recognition not being as high, uh, he has a pretty strong case. Uh, what are his, I mean, yeah, there are a couple of Euro tours. I think he showed well the British as well. Um, yeah, I, he's probably my uh, sleeper pick for the day for sure. I like that call. I think that, and the, isn't Dredge one of your guys too? Yeah, I don't think he's, he didn't, uh, he's actually, uh, he hasn't been as good this year. He's so like, 6,800 kind of, in this range. And I've, I've heard, yeah, heard I think, but like, he's also not been that great lately. So okay. I, I, like Tyrell Hatton has taken his spot officially. All right. So no, no more Dredge. We're going Hatton over him for sure. Yes, okay. definitely. All right. I like two, that call. Two guys I want to ask you about in this tier. Uh, first one is Fino. If we like distance. Oh, yeah. I almost think that that's almost like redundant at this point. Like, if you like yeah. distance, like, just pick Fino. Yeah. What, what about Harold Varner? He's a guy who missed the cut last week at the Canadian Open. He's 6,600, so he's right. He's almost in this, this bargain tier. Has distance. Has been so consistent uh, prior to last week's missed cut. Hadn't missed a cut this season, I, I don't believe. Um, I, I don't know. Is it worth a flyer there at all? Definitely worth a flyer. A couple of sharp people play him uh, in general. I probably won't have too much of him, but uh, yeah, I think he's worth a flyer. The problem is, and, and that's why even at the, we started to really dig for some guys who aren't great plays in that, that bottom tier, there's so many good options in this tier and the next tier that you can really build a lot of rosters with guys in the you know mid-six to you know high-sevens range. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And there's, there's guys that are, are popping for me still in this range that we haven't talked about that I still like. Uh, but yeah, I agree. Definitely a, a range to target for sure. And, you know, in, in our Wednesday live show, perhaps we can talk about um, how that will affect lineup construction. You know, if we like this many guys in this tier, what does that mean as far as actually building your lineup? We can talk about that on Wednesday for sure. Um, definitely remind us when we ask for questions. Uh, all right, let's move up to the next tier. So let's go all the way up to uh, – we'll, we'll, leave, we'll leave the top four like, like normal. I know you guys probably think it's the top three without Jordan, uh, but we'll, we'll leave it. So uh, all the way up uh, to 10-5. So it's uh, Henrik Stenson is the, the last one in this tier. Uh, Colin, your turn. Oh, Colin gets to go first. You won't, okay, Pete, you can get it if you no, want. That's, that's the right. No, that's no, the right. We'll go first. And we'll, we'll go out in and out. So like that's no, 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 no. You you deserve to go first. I just wanted to. <laughs> I wanted to tee you up with JB Holmes and uh, our boy Keegan Bradley being the same price. Oh man, oh, that is so. <laughs> that funny. is hilarious. Oh, um, I agree with you, like, yeah, I agree with your uh, earlier assessment that Stenson's number one overall in this group, but like from a value perspective, like I'm still, if like him and Phil, like, they might be like a little bit too expensive, but I mean, I, I get it one way or another. Um, I still think Bubba Watson is suspiciously cheap for how well he's done. He's, I think he's a decent value up there. My best overall value in this thing, if right now it is Kepka. But I think Kapka has some, like, what, can he, like, not move right now? Isn't the injury? It's like a real ankle injury. And, like, yeah, I, I'm trying to play golf with this Achilles thing. It's definitely no fun when you're not – your ankle's not right, you know? Yeah. So, like, all right. So, like, maybe, like, if we're scratching Kapka and saying, all right, there's injury. Don't, don't scratch him. He's definitely in consideration. Yeah, terms. Exactly. We need to okay, get more so information. Like, Kapka with an asterisk. And then, yeah, I still have Hol- I have Holmes as the number one. Uh, the second overall value here. Uh, although Brandon Grace is not too far behind. They're similarly nice. projected. And, and like Grace is just pretty, I mean, he's had some great results this year. I mean, like we're, I mean, they're, they're in pretty solid long-term rear mirror this stuff, but like 8,000, like that's still, that's major pricing for you. So, um, I mean, I, I'm probably going to build like around one of the big four. So I'm probably not going to pick anybody above, you know, 8,200 <laughs> But if I had to, it's definitely going to be Holmes, Grand Race, and then the other guy that's still pretty cheap here. No, it's not a course fit, but I don't get why it's so cheap is Danny Willett. Um, yeah, there have been a couple bad year results, but I was pretty high on him even before he won the Masters, and those results are still in the window. So I just he hasn't been this cheap in a very long time. It's so enticing. Like all the guys are so excited. I'm definitely on bubble this week. Definitely on bubble this week. And I, I would have played him more and I'm so tilted. He ended up screwing me in a big way in all the tournaments. Uh, Cause you know, he still, he finished plus four, but he made so many birdies. He outscored so many guys uh, who are two under three under uh, in the, the open. A lot of the guys under par. So Bubba um, made up for with all those birdies and his length is going to be a huge asset for him uh, at this course. So I think he's a, a great play. Grace was going to be a guy I was going to bring up right away. I think he's an elite option. Uh, a lot of people have touted him. So I wouldn't be surprised to see his ownership pretty high. Uh, a lot of people really, really like him. Obviously, I'm on J.B. Holmes, never playing Keegan Bradley. Um, but all these guys are intriguing. The guys that probably fade are, are I'm not going to touch Louie, I don't think, with just all the injury stuff. And he just hasn't been playing as well. Probably not on Westwood, even though I know other people will be. A uh, good ball striker, has had success in the majors. But I think there's more talent in this range. Uh, Matsuyama, I've heard that he has a hip injury, um, and that's starting to come through in the data. So he's another guy I'm probably not on, but literally everyone else you can make a good argument for. Stents, incredible play, obviously. His recent stats are off the charts. He's the number one guy in this tier. Mickelson, obviously great. And did Mickelson win this in 05? I sound stupid for saying that. But he did, did. Yes, he did. And he that, that's all. We didn't even cover that as far as his ownership. Right. So he won in 2005. So people are already going to be on that angle. Justin Rose, I think, is like the contrarian play. And like it wouldn't shock me if I ended up like trying to go with Justin Rose and a Thunderdome team. Um, I think he's a really, really nice contrarian play. The back injury was concerning, but um, people don't realize he played incredible at that. Open Championship, uh, you know, you looked at he shot 68, um, 77 around two when he got the absolute worst end of the draw. I was just playing when it was absolutely terrible. Still made the cut, and then 70, 70 on the weekend. Uh, I think he's a really nice option, and he's been really long off the tee uh, at certain points this year when he's been healthy. So I think he's a nice uh, play. And Sergio, uh, if you want to take here's a here's a narrative for you, Colin. It's the ultimate stupid narrative that 
people are talking about and saying how it makes sense. Wait, 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 hey, no, let, let me guess. It's uh, first time or curses are over between DJ and Stenson. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, I, it's, I forgot to bring that up. Like, yeah, I so, bring it up. Oh, it's, it's, it's like the next logical thing. And you can even kind of use it with Willett. It's like the best golfers in the world who don't have a major. Like, well, it's obviously not the same category as like DJ and Stenson, but he's a good golfer and not a major. He gets his first major. Then DJ, then Stenson, and now everyone's like, oh, it's going to obviously be someone who hasn't won a major before. That's how this stuff works. And, of course, that, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that I just give no validity to. But uh, I do like Sergio's form, and uh, he is long enough and a, a great ball striker uh, who's going to hit a lot of greens. So it's really about the putter for Sergio, so I'm on with him. Um, Ricky Fowler will still be on because people want to chase him down. I don't think it's awful. I, I um, think we're still fading him as usual. I, I fade, I'm fading Ricky for sure. But I, 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 I Brian, don't, can we just make that our watermark for like the video image? Just like fade Ricky and that's just like perma on the, the video feed? Yep, yeah, for sure. Yeah, the thing is I like Ricky. I, I hate that I like him, but I never play him. So, uh, yeah, it's one of those weird things. But – those are the guys. We didn't talk about Matt Kuchar and Zach Johnson, who are staples in a lot of people's cash games um, in general. And I wouldn't fault anyone for that, especially Kuchar's been playing well. But it's more expensive now, and it's not a great course fit. Uh, he normally does well on Jack Nicklaus and Pete Dye design courses. Um, that's where all his wins come from. Um, and, you know, he just hasn't showed up as much in the majors, which, again, is kind of like a BS narrative. I, I don't buy that. I think he's just going to do just as well in big stages. Uh, the one issue, I guess, correlates with why he hasn't had as much success in the majors is he's just not long enough. And I think that's going to hurt him at this uh, this course. So, um, yeah, that's the whole tier. They're all relevant, good plays, and uh, they're pretty intriguing. This range is very intriguing. I have a stat for you guys. I don't know if you're ready for this, but I'm going to hit with you anyway. I'm uh, <laughs> in the British Open, uh, Dustin Johnson averaged 30 putts per round. In the British Open, Keegan Bradley averaged 29 putts per round. And Keegan got so hot, dude. He got so lucky. I was so tilted. You know what? My mentions were going hand. People were just firing at me. <laughs> How's he going to feel when Ke Keegan's just crushing it out there? I was, I was massively tilted. I wonder if you believe me if I said half of those were dummy counts I created. Like, that's within the range <laughs> of outcomes there. <laughs> that is really funny. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah. Absolutely. It's so funny. Yeah, Keegan, I love just I, – I, it is fun. But I, 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 I will uh, – I would love to – I mean, I would I would love to play someone. I would actually pay someone a certain percent. I would increase the fee if I knew they had Keegan Bradley in their lineup this week. <laughs> I really would. It's like playing chess with what Bishop odds? Like you just spot them a piece. Like, all right. That's what all I right. feel like. I feel like with uh, and although his recent form has been a lot better. Look at his last four events; he's been a lot better. But You're talking about it like it's a dog that's walking on two legs. Like, oh, he thinks he's people. He thinks he's a real golfer. Uh, I just it's, it just pains me when Keegan does well. But la last week he definitely started out so hot, so hot. Yeah, we're I mean, gonna talk about the big four though. We, uh, we got DJ. <laughs> no, I just want to reflect on the great stat, Brian. You're right. I thought I was ready for that stat, and then it just turned out like no, no, I wasn't. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if we, if we we think Dustin Johnson is a good player, which I think we do, um, and Keegan out outputted him. So yeah, transitive property. All right. Keegan just seen to Dustin Johnson. Just seen to Dustin Johnson. Mm -hmm. We gotta keep moving here, boys. And let's let, let, we can't give Keegan Bradley too much time on the pod. I agree. We we got we got we got to move on. I'm 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 just I'm a massive tilt. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Okay, uh, let's let's move on to the big four then, Pete. Uh, you get to start with this. One. I just have a stat. I'm looking at my model here. Dustin Johnson's recent driving distance is 325.7 yards. Yeah, that is. I mean, that he. That's no, that's, pretty uh, far. Yeah, but like he's always been that way. I feel like it's an appropriate. It is probably appropriate this week to pull a Dennis Green, may rest in peace, and say he is who we thought he was. We did. He, yeah. I totally botched that. But what is it? Yeah, he is who he we thought he is. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, he. I mean, he averaged three fifteen long term. He's he's always insanely long, but he's just like taking his game to a whole nother level. Um, you watch him, and he just puts on a show with those drives. It's just so ridiculous. I mean, the game's a lot easier when you're just hitting wedge into everything. So, yeah, yeah, he's he's pretty good. Yeah, I I think yeah, I think we're on pretty much universal claim here. I mean, he's he is the number one option, even all pre like even value total thing, total package, just like everything. Like, yeah, I mean, it's, who, it's who'd you who'd you rather have for fantasy points, Dustin Johnson and Jordan Spieth, 
or Day and McElroy? Oh, that is so close. Uh, um, I would probably pick the middle two, and I think Spieth is the weak anchor here that's not holding up his end. Uh, it's always a question of, like, when is he going to drop out of the big four here? And I think, like, I, I have him and Stenson really close. I think you can even and how much you want to discount that outlier round. Even Stenson could, could run his spot in, like, the big four or the upper echelon right now. I mean, just every time we think he's going to bounce back, it's just like, oh, like, his, his log has just been, like, uh, it's, it's been not good, uh, like, in the last, since, uh, since June, last eight weeks. Yeah, to, to be yeah, fair, he was in the bad side of the draw in the British, which I, I am, like, that's one thing. The British Open definitely, like, is skewing how I'm looking at this recent data. Like, the recent form stuff, like, anyone who was on the wrong side of the draw, especially, like, Spieth was saying he was aiming 70 yards left of his target, like, trying to slap it out there and just hope that the wind would blow it all the way into the fairway. Yeah. That's what I was like, hope for him. You know? Like, yeah, all it, it, yeah. Tr- that it, you're absolutely right, and that, that, that won't be necessarily something that models will pick up. I mean, we talk about good round out like your skew, but there's just so much weather to you. Like, if you're on the bad side, like, there's no – we're not giving them a discount in long-term adjusted ground. We're just seeing how they do relative to the field. And it probably is something worth like going forward. Like, all right, maybe cut them some slack or if somebody had a really easy like weather condition, like, all right, like maybe don't give them as much, but yeah, I think that's a very fair observation and uh, a, a blind spot. Absolutely. In the yeah. So I'm just trying to give you that, but I agree with you speaks below the, the other four guys. The problem is with these guys, like, and I know this for sure, and after studying some lineups, like, in the Millionaire Maker and, like, any tournament where there's, like, you know, a lot of multi-entering, certain guys are playing certain guys. Like, there's so many fans out there who always play Rory. There's so many guys who always play DJ. There's the Speed guys out there. Although the one advantage that you can take with this is you want to play the ownership angle big. The higher stake stuff, speed is definitely not uh, being taken as much, and that's sharp. I mean, that's just that, that there's a reason for that. There, that's that's been the sharp thing. The other guys have more equity, but uh, it's been dangerously low. So there is some opportunity, just strictly from a tournament standpoint, with how low speed's ownership's getting. Um, but DJ Day and Rory, certain guys just play those guys regardless, and uh, that's an unfortunate thing with Rory because I would really love Rory here if I knew he was going to be significantly lower owned than Day and DJ. I think he has a great spot chance to do extremely well here, um, but I think he's going to be owned just as much as these guys. So that's the unfortunate part for me. Um, I think it's DJ is the best overall equity play, and then it's just game theory and the rest of the guys. Colin, a question for you. What exactly about Jordan's data makes him uh, less than those other guys? I mean, if you look at his long-term adjusted round score, it's only behind Jason Day. If you look at his recent adjusted round score, it's tied with Rory, uh, and it's a top 10 mark in this slate. I get if you look at his game logs, it doesn't look as good as these other guys. I mean, their highs are much higher than, than Jordan recently, especially Dustin Johnson. But, like, looking at the, the models, what about his data in the models makes him uh, such a bad play and, and the reason that people dislike him so much right now? Um, I think in terms, like, for DraftKings scoring, like, I think we've been on, like, the angle of, like, driving distance is still probably a little bit, like, uh, not as good as people give him credit for. And, like, if models like that, it's kind of like their base component, then, like, he has the worst driving distance of the big four by far. So, uh, I mean, there's a lot of reason to prefer it. It's the most stable week-to-week stat. It's the most correlative, like, with score, like fantasy scoring over the long run. And I think there's a decent reason to be bearish on that. Like, all right, he doesn't have the elite distance like the other three do. Uh, so there's, like, you basically, you basically have to rely on uh, – like himself getting himself out of trouble or elite putting. So if, if yeah. yeah, he has the upside with the putting. So just yeah, one real yeah. quick. He can get hot, like no question there. Here's, here's just an interesting side. And this is something I'm looking at more. And, and there's, I use the birdie stuff on, on fantasy labs as well, but just weighted birdie average for the year. And this is why I think Rory is intriguing. Rory is number one still tied for second with the same, with like a very almost identical average. Um, I guess it is two Dustin Johnson, three Jordan Spieth. Um, so McElroy, Dustin Johnson, Jordan Spieth, Stenson four, Matsuyama five, who's still way up there. I just don't think he's healthy. Then this is what I, this is what makes it fun. JB Holmes, number six. JB Holmes is the man. 
And uh, Jimmy Holmes is also climbing the world golf rankings too. So I don't know how he's still uh, – he, the secret's not going to be out there much longer. So, Colin, enjoy it this one last week here with JB. I, yeah, I guess I have to. By the time that NFL season rolls rolls around, he'll just be a household name. Yeah, exactly. Mickelson at number eight, Jason Day uh, – or, I'm sorry, Mickelson at number seven, Day at number eight, Sergi at number nine, Scott at number ten. And then some other guys we talked about, Kepka at 11, Schwartz at 12. So, all relevant names, all guys we're talking about a lot. So, we are picking that up in the data as well. But just one stat uh, that I think is interesting – uh, is the way to birdie average. So, um, yeah, I think that the top four, we, we've talked, I mean, we're kind of on the same place. Um, what do you, what, what, I'm just curious, how, how close in points do you have speed from the rest of the guys right now? Cause I imagine the other three, it's a pretty narrow band. I mean, I probably have the same gap. I have the same gap between, um, D- DJ and Jason day that I do between, uh, Rory and Jordan. Jordan's actually a little bit bigger of a gap between the two. And is Stenson past Jordan and overall? Uh, no, they're neck and neck, but like that could just as easily flip with even like a one mile an hour difference in wind. So I have them pretty much even. Okay, cool. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun this week, and uh, I'm really excited for the rest of the content. Brian, you have any other thoughts? I guess we have to pick our winners too, right? Nah, we'll hold that to Wednesday. I do love Jordan this week. I'm going to go ahead and state that. And Ooh, hot take. All right. Yeah, I, do like I might. That. I might have to roster him in a spot. I might. I'm, I'm thinking about it because I'm just. If his ownership is like five percent, these other guys are like thirty five. I mean, it starts to get intriguing. So yeah, I agree. Yeah, and that's and, and that's another point is you know we talked about the recency bias on on Stinson and and Mickelson, but it also goes the other way. Like, who are the guys that got just like really crappy draws uh, and struggled perhaps more than they should? Uh, you know, a lot of these guys battled even in terrible weather, Jason Day, even Jordan battled, you know. And, and Rory did too. I think yeah. Rose, Justin Rose is the sneaky guy out of that group. People haven't been playing Rose at all, and I think with roster, I've just made, I haven't made like a ton of lineups yet, but just making some, those those guys in that range are like, you're almost always rostering Bubba or none of those guys in that range. So it's um, it's, it's, it's intriguing. I think Rose and Scott uh, will, be, will be interesting to see where their ownership falls. Yeah, Bubba's super intriguing. Gosh, I, I hate that weather draw for him the other week. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so well, I guess we'll end it there. We'll um, obviously have our content. Again, Pete's going to have his video. He's going to periscope tomorrow, uh, or I guess you know, today if you're watching this uh, on Tuesday. We'll have our live show on Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern time. Again, uh, send in any questions to us. Tweet us. We'll we'll pub it out on, on Twitter. Uh, you can send any questions to podcast at fans.com. So the email, I'll grab those as well. Uh, and we'll answer any questions you may have. We'll go over weather. We'll go over line data. We'll pick our winners uh, and we'll have some fun. So please join us Wednesday. Uh, Colin, Pete, thanks guys. We'll talk to you guys in a little bit.